Hey, everybody. My name is Brad. Uh, we are at the Pace Studio in New York right now with the director of the movie VH, VHS, Mr. Mm-hmm. Jack Henry Robbins. Dude, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. Um, so I had the pleasure of watching your movie yesterday and two days ago. I've now seen it twice. Oh, cool. I enjoyed it very, very much. And um, it is, uh, let's dive into just a brief overview of what this movie even is. I mean, it it's difficult to describe in words. It's fu- no, you're going to start cursing. I'm not going to start cursing. It no, is you're not going to curse. Effing uh, nuts. It is one of the more more bizarre movies I've ever seen in my life, and I enjoyed it enough to watch it twice. Can you tell people a little bit about yeah, what to expect? Uh, the, the, the movie is called VHS, of, uh, and it's about a 12-year-old kid who records over his parents' wedding tape the same week that his parents' marriage is falling apart. Uh, it's shot entirely on VHS and Betacam. Uh, it stars some amazing people like Carrie Kenny and Thomas Lennon. Yeah, man. And uh, it's it's a funny, weird ride. It's been getting really good reviews, and it's really positive. Uh, before we start, though, I'd like to just make a suggestion, if that's okay. Yeah. Just to get the views up, I think it would be really smart for us to title this something a little different. Maybe we could title it Timothy Chalamet Reveal Secret. <laughs> Is that okay? With <laughs> Taro, you? can you get on that immediately? We'll just change it. Uh, we'll the... say, well, or not, but it's just a thought. Or something right. with Timothy Chalamet or Kim Kardashian. Or I'm just trying yeah. to get the views up for this right, movie. Right, but right. Yeah, so Timothy pr- Chalamet and Kim Kardashian. Everyone takes off dot, their dot, shirts. Dot. And then... Yeah, exactly. So I'm just thinking out loud. But um, So yeah, so our movie uh, is this really, really trippy, but very funny movie. I mean, it's, it sounds weird me saying it, but what did you think of it? I thought that it was very trippy and very funny. And it was there were a number of different times in the movie where I had the sense that I thought I knew where you were going next with it, and I was wrong 100% of the time. Yeah. It seemed like it was going to be a thing, and it was that thing for a brief moment, and then the rest of the outcome of the movie wasn't based on that twist or the new information. It just continued to give me new information well, and continued to change tones throughout the entire thing. Well, it's told in a super unique way. So it's told through pretty much this kid gets a... Uh, gets a camera, VHS camera for Christmas and starts recording over his parents' wedding tape, which so you're pretty much watching the tape as it gets recorded over. So the movie is his life, late night television and the wedding and how they all kind of intersect into this one mixtape. Um, it's kind of a very original way of telling a story. It took a long time to get the edit right, but it's finally done. And uh, it's hitting theaters at Alamo Draft House. Uh, we got in a great response from everyone who's seen it. Um, and if you like, if you like different, if you like VHS nostalgia, it's like a journey into late night television of the 1980s. It's it's super weird and funny, but also it all originated with uh, we got two films into Sundance that were both shot on VHS. So and that one, Carrie was in one of them, right? Yes, Carrie Kenny's in this thing called Painting with Joan, which you can actually can look up online. It's actually online. Oh yeah, it's very funny. It's on Vimeo and it's a very uh, Bob Ross vibey kind it's of. It's a Bob uh, Ross meets like her his angel uh, devil sister, and then uh, <laughs> then the other one is called Hot Winter, a film by Dick Pierre, yeah. which is a 1980s porno about climate change where the sex has been edited out of the movie. So uh, it's pretty much the, the premise is the first movie ever to talk about global warming was a pornography, and this is the movie without the sex. Right, with so. Just the interesting parts and the wonderful acting included. Yeah, but, the, uh, and the yeah. tour de forces. I need to show you this. I did okay. not tell you this offline, but we got porn. Oh, cool. Nice. Yeah, man. Look at this. So, I mean, this I, I do want to discuss tape formats because that's so central to the production of this. I'm glad that this. you said I want to discuss tape formats and not porn with you because I really don't want to do that. No, 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 no. Not okay. at all. So this is a film called Straight Banana, which Ooh. is on umatic three-quarter inch. Remember, Sh- wait, you- st- straight banana? Yeah, dude. That's funny because bananas are not uh, exactly straight. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. So, so someone, we got that. So someone had to hide this from someone. <laughs> yes. This is a huge it thing to up, hide. Dude, it ended up in this tape archive. that Somebody stole it from the video center of Marin. Oh somebody rented it and I then never gave woman. it back. No, I'm just <laughs> uh, this is cool. Someone dude, rented it? 
from that place and then just never gave it back to that video rental place. Video and it just Center ended up in this archive. Marin. Yeah. Mill Valley. So this is a... Uh, Shout out to San Francisco people. <laughs> That's right. That's where I'm from. Oh, really? It's yeah. actually... Uh, it will be showing in San Francisco. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's important to note uh, January 17th is when this is premiering. It's with San Francisco, Austin, and New York. Well, so January 12th is a special event Q&A live stream. Cool. Is that here in New York? crew. No, well, it's... It takes place in LA, but it's live streamed in New York, Austin, North Carolina, uh, all over Texas. At Alamo? Yes, all at Alamo Draft Houses. Uh, and it's pretty much, it's all over the place. Uh, the 17th is when it's going to really hit theaters. But I mean, I'd recommend seeing it the 12th too, because it's got Kerry Kenny, Thomas Lennon, John Gemmerling. Uh, all live in person. Yeah, so. yeah, dude. And uh, I mean, the state was one of my favorite television shows. I know Bob, mm-hmm. sound engineer, is a massive Stella fan. Oh my Everybody's God, a Reno nine one one fan. And uh, yeah, I mean, it was it was cool seeing. I mean, this is a very surreal and a bizarre movie, and it just added to the surreality, if that's a word, and bizarreness of it. To see Carrie, I mean, she's a recognizable face. Thomas Lennon, to me, is a recognizable face. And uh, to see these people who I recognize from so many other different contexts mm-hmm. in such a bizarre piece made it even more bizarre somehow. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I enjoyed that casting choice quite a bit. Oh, yeah. I mean, I was just lucky that they said yes. Yeah. You know, uh, Carrie's kind of the godmother of this whole project because. Without her, we would have not gone to Sundance. We would have not worked with Oscilloscope Films, who put this whole thing on. Um, but yeah, I mean, just to see them, they never interact in the movie. But, you know, Reno 911 is something I grew up with and loved dearly. And just to see them back at it together. And they just announced that Reno 911 is coming back nice. for another series. So. Nice. I did not hear that. Yeah. Um, can we talk? So we've got, I think it's in the frame. Um, I think people can see that. Um, the tape formats that were utilized to create this project, it was shot entirely on VHS and DigiBeta. Yes, yeah, so it was shot entirely on VHS and beta, uh, beta cam, DigiBeta. This is actually not used in the movie, but this is a VHSC camera that I just, I guess, bring around for my own pleasure for yeah. some reason. Um, and then, uh, so yeah, so the whole movie was shot on tape, which was a very interesting journey uh, to shoot that in 2000. And nineteen, um, the beta cam. We got an old beta cam from eBay. It was a journey. Just we, have, you know, because you really have to be careful with these VHS cameras because they can crap out at any moment. None of them can exist without being plugged in. So anytime we were handheld or anytime we were on a schedule, we had to have a rigged camera bag with batteries in it, so you could always have the camera plugged in. A lot of little secrets about it. We also had to figure out a way that we could monitor it wherever we went. So we went through this crazy process of figuring that out. Everything in the movie is analog. The uh, the uh, visual effects of the transitions between the channels were all done with a uh, box, a mm-hmm. digital box. Uh, I'm not going to give away all of our secrets, but yep. there's uh, it, everything's digital. I mean, uh, everything is analog. So there, yeah, and then I would imagine that the process of figuring out a way to monitor it and figuring out a way to power it and all that, there's a lot of exposed wires, wire strippers, and a lot of electrical tape making one thing talk to another thing. Like, there's not boxes that necessarily do that. You can't go to B&H and get the thing that you need to do that. No. I would there's imagine. There's a lot of making. eBaying. Yeah. There's a lot of eBaying. There's a lot of uh, consulting. Uh, we worked with all these different... Uh, people who specialize in different things. Our our camera we end up using for most of the shoot, we use parts from different things to make it like one supreme camera that we called Old Faithful. They all had different personalities. So we had five different cameras that all had different personalities. Oh, this zoom is really good. Let's use it in this zoom scene. Oh, this this one has good auto... Because like everything, we used a, a Panasonic AG-156, which is like this huge. It's humongous and... Uh, it has auto focus and auto correct. I mean, that was the reason why I wanted to go completely genuine with it is because you can't recreate the auto focus and you can't recreate the auto exposure. Like in a camera with a or the zoom, the zoom is so uh, so of that era. You mm-hmm. know that that's kind of jolty zoom that we really wanted to use that. And then based on what we were filming, like all the 80s commercials we filmed, we shot on beta cam because they would have shot either on beta or film. Right. But we didn't have, you know, budget for film, but we did everything beta cam. 
Well, dude, I, visually it's striking, it's fascinating, and it's I like that. I mean, one of the one of the reasons we wanted to make sure to to get you into this room in particular was the fact that we're surrounded by all this stuff, and there's 20 different formats. I know it's of, so crazy. Um, of tape back here. I mean, there's the EIAJ three quarter inch. There's a ton of films. These guys are all 35 millimeter back here. There's a what ton. What is that, Santana? Yeah, dude, that's Santana's 1973 South American tour documentary. Um, he was um, managed by Bill Graham at that time. Oh, wow. And so these, these cans, there's three 35 millimeter reels in the fat one and two 35 reels over there. Um, Elvis? Costello, Elvis, Elvis Costello. Costello. There, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, Elvis Costello sitting next to The Clash and Loretta Amazing. Lynn and Iggy Pop. Why not? Yeah, that's um, so cool. And so this is all of um, Bill Graham's stuff. Well, Most Bill, of it? Bill Graham's collection comprises, I don't know, maybe a quarter of what's in this room right here. Uh, and this room here represents about 1% of the whole collection. The yeah. massive wow, majority really? of this stuff is off-site in, wow. in long-term storage and sto in warehouses across the country. Um, but some of this stuff is from the Newport Jazz Festival, so that's oh, why the wow. John Coltrane cool. tapes and the B.B. King and the Buddy Guy and Dr. Amazing, John yeah. and all that. Um, um, and so I mean, there is a massive amount of psychedelic pop, psychedelic rock from yeah, the yeah. Bill Graham era because I mean, he's booking the Fillmore and he's probably more responsible mm -hmm. for the vibe of the summer of love in 67, 68 than anybody. Cause yeah. he was the one booking the, the, the grateful dead and Janis Joplin and all that. Um, and so the psychedelic pop artists that you've chosen to include in, in your soundtrack are outstanding, man. I mean, I was not familiar with Conan Moccasin. I wasn't familiar with Dent May, but we've been mm -hmm. listening to him all day. I was listening to him all weekend because mm -hmm. of your movie and wise blood. I mean, that's, that's particular segment in the movie is very interesting in the way that you chose to use her, the audio. Like that's the only time that it's sort of, it's like this, beautifully mixed, wonderful sounding studio audio. And it's, mm -hmm. you know, that, that decision was interesting as well. There is, there's a ton of psychedelic rock and psychedelic pop sitting on these shelves. You've got mm -hmm. a ton of, you know, Pink Floyd and Traffic and, and John Lennon. And uh, your soundtrack is so, so interesting with psychedelic pop that was, it's updated for 2019, mm -hmm. but also makes sense in 1987 when yeah. the movie's set. Mm -hmm. Can you talk more about the importance of the artists who you chose to include on the soundtrack? Well, I mean, there's two different elements of the movie. There's the, the bands within the movie and then the soundtrack of the score. So the, the bands within the movie, we had everyone from Wolf Peck, to Conan Moccasin, to Wise Blood, Dent May, to The Prettiest Eyes. Those are all the kind of the artists. And then, of course, Eric Johnson did a lot of the score, who is the lead singer of the Fruit Bats. Totally. He was here like two months ago, yeah. not even two months ago, with doing a, one of these. With a clean beard. Um, but yeah, so so pretty much, I mean, I've always, I love Wise Blood and I love Conan Moccasin. And Conan's song kind of appears in the, one of our trippiest parts of the movie. So it just kind of worked. Uh, we fought really hard to get that song in work. But with Wise Blood, I mean, her song, uh, so she has a song in our movie called Generation Y, which is from her, not the newest record, but the last Titanic. record. Titanic. No, that's the newest the, record. Right, right. It's the one before that. And Generation Y is about um, the modern experience of being on your phones constantly and what that does to your subconscious and your, your heart. And, uh, that's kind of what our movie's about. Uh, there's hidden elements of, even though it's set in the 80s, there's this uh, idea of what you record is what you become if you let it. Where is really what's happening is that's not your real life. What you record on V, because VHS was the beginning of this obsession with um, recording your life. It was the first time that we were easily recording our lives. Like, so before with 16 millimeter or eight mil, sorry, eight millimeter, it was expensive and it was hard to film your life. You had to have, you know, the right light just to even get the image. VHS was the first time we were recording everything, recording our shows, recording our lives, having them all mix. And it was the beginning of this culture of kind of not the decline of culture, but a self obsessive culture. And um, so Wise Blood's song, Generation Y, for me was like imperative. Like it's so, and it's right at the end of the movie, it's at the climax of the film. And she does this beautiful version of it that's slower than the album. So if you're a fan of Wise Blood, you really should check out the movie. I don't know if the song will ever be released outside of the movie, to be honest. Um, but yeah, so her song is really imperative in the film and is surreal. And it's just one of my favorite parts of the movie. And then, 
Dent May did the, actually the, there's a part of in our movie that's an aerobics section. He actually did that song as well. Nice. So uh, he's an amazing artist in LA who's Dre and a good friend of mine. Hey, Dent. Um, but yeah, and then uh, The Prettiest Eyes play the punk band. And I think punk is something, they, they, that song that they play is not their actual song. The song that they play is is, song is now they, the time to start cursing. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's it called is. um. It, it's uh. It, it's called ass fuck six six six, and they play a band within the movie called the Flembats, which was really fun. But they're awesome. They're like a psych uh, punk band in uh, L.A. that's blowing up right now on Castleface Records, and they're amazing. And and uh, they just completely bring it. And uh, no spoilers, but they destroy the set they're in and. I wanted to have the punk energy because for me, one of the things of the 80s was those basement punk shows. So that's where Charlene Yee is in our movie as she hosts a punk show. And just so like perfectly awkward and weird. Oh, and of course. Did, she's great, man. Uh, yeah, Charlene is just amazing. I'm so blessed we got to work with her. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, so that's kind of the thing. And then the Conan thing kind of just happened. And then what was really interesting about the score of our movie is we had to make the music kind of fit the era. So like if you're watching a commercial, it has to be kind of corny. You can't have really good score ever because like you're in a niche area of this 1980s crappy score zone. And like for the pornos we did, you know, you need shitty things to cut, except for Wolfpack is actually like makes that so amazing. Wolfpack yeah. is like, if you could choose a band to score a They have been porno, pioneering that aesthetic yeah. for their entire careers. Yeah, no, they're amazing. So Corey we, Wong came in here and did one of oh, these. Oh, really? Things. Yeah. I mean, they're amazing. We got so lucky with our score. It's so many talented people uh, threw down on this and and we're really we're really excited about it. I mean, if you love music, it's a really good movie for that. It is Just indeed. to see, the, especially the wise blood at the end is like, that whole performance, it kills me, man. It's just yeah. wrenching. And that's that's the one time that you make the decision to move into out of like captured audio on set and mm -hmm. into this absolutely beautiful studio rendition of it. And mm -hmm. it's yeah, man, it, it is amazing. And that was um I've discovered a number of new artists because of it. I mean, mm -hmm. that's been the soundtrack to my entire weekend. I suspect it will be the soundtrack to my uh many future weeks coming up. I mean, I dig mm -hmm. it completely. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah. Yeah, and I wanted to. I mean, I I want to dive into which you already have uh, to a certain extent covered the uh, the the commentary on social media culture, mm -hmm. the attention economy, and being plugged in at all times. I wanted to tell you so that you personally think that I'm a cool person that oh, I cool. threw my telephone into the trash can five months ago. Really? Actually, it's, yeah. I threw it away at a bar. I I got it in the trash can. It was like thirty feet away from me. Nailed it. Were I took you, that as a, Were you drunk? Oh yeah. Okay. I was loaded. But I had had that thought for my, I mean, everyone has that thought. Yeah, yeah. Dude, this is not good for my brain. No. It can't just be scrolling through this shit all the time. And so I threw away my phone. It's been gone. And I do feel a certain sense of liberation from that. Yeah. And um, and I mean, that is the, it's not an accident that you're, that I paid real attention to your film because that's such the pervasive message behind the entire thing is, you know, not the message being not throw away your phone, but be aware of what this constant attention to a, a news feed or the need to document everything, be aware of what that's doing to your brain because it's not necessarily healthy if you're not aware of what's what's happening. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's a balance, but I mean, if you would have told a monk in the 1200s or something uh, that we'd have a belt that anyone could reach you at any time and it'd buzz... They'd be like, "That's gonna kill society and our culture." Like, I mean, I'm not, I'm not perfect. I, I, I'm on my phone and I check things, but I don't think my life's been made better because of it. I think there's a certain kind of texture that we all can access that's within us. That's a really deep, natural texture that has been really eroded since the last ten years. I mean, who's whose mind feels more at ease in the last 10 years? I mean, I think that one of the reasons we feel such nostalgia for the, the 90s is because we didn't have that. Um, I, I mean, our movie is, a, is, is in a way about that. Uh, and like, you know, the interview show in the beginning, you know, uh, is kind of talks about that where, where uh, there's this uh, alarmist who's talking about what the future could be like with these VHS cameras. Because VHS was really the first time that we 
filmed so much of our lives and thought it was important. And now it's like we just you know shoot anything, and it's 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 hard because it's like I I have friends who there's instant gratification. So if you have people who follow you, if you have hundreds of thousands of followers, if you post something about yourself, you get ten thousand people saying you're beautiful. That's really positive, and that's that. But then I I think that it affects how we're able to create art and how deep we really go with our art. And that's something I'm working on. You know what I mean? I think that, you know, luckily New Year's is coming up and we all can make our promises to ourselves. Dude, it. throw away your phone, man. I've been proselytizing for I that can't. shit for I a, a while. I have a movie that's about to come out. I got to do really shallow social posts <laughs> about how important it was for me to make this movie. But I mean, I think that, you know, there's ways to do it. I know Natalie Wiseblood, um, I, we're friends. She she has a box in her house that she puts her phone in when she's working, nice. which is smart. Yeah, uh, stuff like that. I think there's ways. Uh, I know that I forgot who his name is, but I met the uh, the DP of Good Time. He's an um, the Safety na- Brothers. Yeah. Oh yeah. my god, have you I, seen Uncut Gems yet? No, I have not. Jesus, man, it's good. I heard it's intense. Um, but he has a flip phone, which doesn't access internet. For me, when I'm writing, I have a computer that can't access the internet. So I think that's really helpful. Yeah. <laughs> it's really shitty. It's a really shitty computer, but it's great for writing because it's like you can't just go off on tangents or yeah. you know check your whatever. But anyway, I think we're all struggling with it. But I think I think would be you know it's definitely not helping our our consciousness that much. But I think there's at least we're aware of it, which is the first step. Well, dude, on on every level of interpretation that I was able to interpret it, interpret it. No, it's um, interpretate. I, I interpretate. It's Jesus. interpretate. Thank you for drawing extra attention to that, Jack. Um, I <laughs> I interpreted it super well, and on every level that I did that, I enjoyed it. Even if you choose not to interpret it directly, based on the. Uh, um, the impact that social media is having on our lives. I mean, it is an enjoyable film, even if that doesn't cross your mind oh, yeah. at all. And so, well, it's also just funny. It's a really funny movie, yeah. right? I yeah, think. it is. So. Dude, thank you very much yeah, for coming and doing this. We appreciate it. And um, the internet, the um, so January 12th is when the live, live stream, stream happens, mm-hmm. and that's happening in, uh, in Alamo Draft Houses across Pre- the country. Yeah, pretty much across the country. And then properly premieres on, the se- on January 17th. Yeah, and it's worth seeing in theaters because it's really an experience. I mean, it's it's in it's. I think it's literally the first movie ever to be filmed on VHS, intending to be put into theaters. Because if you think about it, all the VHS movies back in the day, were straight to tape, but this is actually a cinematic experience on VHS. It's weird. I can't believe it happened. Yeah. So, anyway, yeah. I hope uh, everyone goes sees the movie and shares with your friends, and it's gonna be a fun time, dude. Thank you for doing this. Yeah, no worries. VHS, Jack Henry Robbins, man. Thank you very much, and um, that's it. Thank you guys for watching. Have an analog adventure. <laughs>